tested. We invite Wendy to come forward and I will pray for you. Lord, you have placed your message on Wendy's heart. Help her to share it clearly and help us have hearts and minds to receive it. Amen. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, Barb, for the children's story. Barb took the positive aspect on this scripture, and I must confess I'm guilty of the negative aspect. When I first looked at this passage, this was my reaction. I don't want to preach on that. People have heard that too many times. They're tired of it. I'm tired of it. And frankly, I don't know what to say about it. In fact, I tried to take a different week, and I don't know why Jess gave me two options, because he came back and said, no, actually, I need you to take this week. <laughs> that's when God got to work on me, and I think that's God's purpose when I preach is to work on me. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies... Unless we hate our life in this world, we lose it. I don't like the idea of falling, and I definitely don't like the idea of dying. Everything in us fights to live, and rightfully so, because God has planted in us a deep instinct for survival. And so death the idea of death hits us at the very core of what we do not want or desire. And it gives us a lot to work through. It likely triggers things in us, memories of death, hard death, loved ones, tough stuff, difficult losses, death of dreams, and on and on. Frankly, I think death stinks. Death stinks. It does. It hurts. And yet, here we are. And Jesus uses this imagery of a seed. Now, as a person who grew up on a seed farm, I can't get away from this image. We, um, we had a seed farm. We cleaned seeds so that farmers could plant seed that, so it wouldn't have weeds in it. They wanted seeds that would germinate so that they would produce the crop that Jesus talks about in this passage. They didn't want to plant weeds with their seeds and get it choked out. And so I worked with lots of seeds, alfalfa seeds, wheat seeds, soybean seeds, native grass seeds, always fighting weed seeds and the things that would destroy the plants. And I participated in many aspects of seed growing. Roguing wheat in the hot sun. If you haven't done that, you've missed out a lot. <laughs> you get a bunch of people in the field and you spread out like this and you walk the entire field to make sure there's no stray kind of irregular heads or bad noxious weeds before harvest comes and it's hot and windy, and it's miserable, and that's that. <laughs> and then there was digging stickers in the pastures because the weed seeds got in the pasture, and our sheep were even too smart to eat stickers. But the absolute worst is when we had to go into the pit of the elevator shaft and get out the rotting seeds that had fallen in there and been rained on. Yeah, oh dear. <laughs> I cannot begin to describe the stench. It was worse than a group of soccer players with dirty, stinky feet in my van. I've had that before. It was, dur it was worse than a, it seriously was worse than a, a pond of dead fish which we had fish too. 
What is the worst smell you've ever had? <laughs> and so we'd be down in this pit with five gallon buckets and we'd have to climb up the ladder with these buckets full of stinking things wondering if we were going to die from the fumes. And my dad and mom are just sitting back there smiling. My dad would think that we were building character when we were down in that pit. <laughs> and I like to tell Micah that too when he had that same job. Yeah, I did that. Look at the character it's building. <laughs> but those images came back to me as I looked at this scripture text and the, and the light bulb began to came, come on. Did you know that in John's gospel, John says that death stinks? The passages ahead of today's scripture, the context of today's scripture, Jesus is out teaching and preaching and healing, and he's across the Jordan River and he gives this message, your friend Lazarus is dying, please come and heal him of his illness. And Jesus' immediate response is, this illness will not lead to death, but my father will be glorified. And he's, he goes on to just take his time, healing other people, visiting people, no rush. And when he arrives, Lazarus has died. And there is great mourning going on. There is much sorrow. Lazarus has been dead for four days. And Jesus is greeted by his sisters, each separately. Mary and Martha come to Jesus and they say, if you had come, our brother would not have died. If you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. The sorrow, the desperation for them is too late. And Jesus looks at Martha and he says, your brother will rise again. She says, well, I know, on the resurrection of the last day. And the other people who are there are saying, this man can heal the eyes of the blind. If he would have come, he would have saved this man from death. For them, it's too late. But Jesus looks at Martha and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me, will never die. Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And she says, well, yes, he's going to rise at the resurrection in the last day. But Jesus is saying, do you believe that right now I can resurrect him? And I think Jesus is saying to us, do you believe that right now I can give you new life? I can resurrect your existence? Do you believe me? And so he proceeds to go to the entrance of the grave. And he insists that they move that stone away from the, the gravestone away and open up that tomb. <laughs> no, Jesus, don't make us go there. It's bad enough, we've been through it, it's over, don't. It stinks. There's a stench, he's been dead for four days. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God. And I don't know what they believed, but they believed enough to obey him, and they opened up that tomb. And Jesus cried out and said, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. And the dead man, who's no longer dead, walks out. His face is bound, his arms, his hands are bound, and Jesus says, free him. Take off those grave clothes. Lazarus, live again. Live again. What a triumph. How amazing. Think about that. 
and the crowd is gathered and they're amazed and there's a whole lot of commotion. But this victory is also a, trage a tragedy and an irony because as the religious leaders hear about this, they become afraid. If the Romans hear about this, they're going to take our place in our nation. We can't let him keep doing this. And it is at this point that they begin to plot to kill him. They are threatened. If we let him go, we will lose our privilege. Their hands are grasping on to power and control, clutching desperately what they think they know so that they cannot see the miracle of what Jesus has done. Give us a break. This man just raised someone from the dead. He's not just some blasphemer running around. Open your eyes. But they're clutching. They're blind. And look what they do. They plot to kill him? Really? And so it says that Jesus could no longer move freely. He's under the radar, spending time in private with his disciples. And what he's doing is preparing them for his upcoming death. And so in this process, he returns again to the house of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And as he is there, Mary is so overtaken with her gratitude that she anoints his feet with perfume and wipes it with her hair. And Judas says, what a waste. This money should be given to the poor. And Jesus responds, the poor you will always have with you, but you won't always have me. She's preparing me for my death, for my burial. And so the crowd has gathered there again because they've heard that Jesus is here, and they want to see Lazarus, this man that was raised from the dead, and so, of course, the Pharisees get wind of this, and they've made this decree that anybody that sees Jesus should let them know so they could come kill him. And at this point, they plot not only to kill Jesus, but to kill Lazarus. Because Lazarus is the proof. Think about that. And the, the feast of the Passover has arrived and people are beginning to gather in Jerusalem and they're wondering, is Jesus going to show up? Because you know what they said they're going to do if he shows up. And they are enslaved by fear. Think of the irony of this. The Passover was to celebrate the freedom from slavery in Egypt. And here they are, enslaved by their fears of Jesus' power to resurrect and somehow take away their power. How ironic. And Jesus, in fact, does determine to go to Jerusalem. Isaiah 50, verse 7 says, The Lord God helps me, therefore I set my face like flint. I will not be ashamed. Flint is this hard rock that they use to make tools. And I, I love this image of Jesus setting his face like flint, cutting through the chaos, cutting through the fear, cutting through the death that lied ahead to move forward. And as he goes into to Jerusalem, this crowd greets him with exuberance. That's that's next Sunday, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. And it says that the crowd that gathered were those who had seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. And when the Pharisees see this, they just throw up their hands and they say, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world is coming after him. And kind of to prove this point, John goes on and this is where our text begins today, verse 20. The Greeks had come to see Jesus. They have come. 
We wish to see Jesus, they tell his disciples. And the disciples are excited, and they come to say to Jesus, look, these Greeks have come. They want to meet you. Come meet them. And wouldn't we think he would want to, right? This is amazing. The word is getting out. People can believe. I want to welcome them. But he starts into this talk about dying. And in the message, this is what he says. Time's up. Time's up. Well, when the buzzer rings at the end of a basketball game, time's up. It's too late. When the bell rings at the end of your licensing exam, you can't go back and change any answers. What's done is done. We've moved beyond this point. We don't have time for that anymore. It's done. Time is up. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen carefully. I like how it's written in the message. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone, listen to how he says this, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. If we grasp even life itself too hard, we lose it. But he doesn't stop there. If anyone wants to serve me, he must follow me. Then you'll be where I am, ready to serve at a moment's notice. The Father will honor and reward everyone who serves me. You see, he doesn't just talk about his death. He talks about the fact that if we truly believe him, if we truly are his disciples, which is what it means to follow Jesus, to live his example, it can include following him even to death. To follow Jesus means to put faith into action. Do you believe, Martha? Do you believe me? This is troubling news because death hurts. It is a hard, ugly process. In fact, Jesus is troubled as he faces his death and he says, I'm shaken. What am I going to say? Father, save me from this. But no, I will follow. I will choose trust over fear. Jesus truly has agony as he faces this cost, but he chooses trust. And then he goes on to proclaim victory. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Indicating the kind of death he was to die. All people, including the Greeks who have come to see him. And he's just going straight to the message. This is what it means if you believe in me. How can it be that in dying he is driving out the ruler of this world? Why can't he just kill him? How is it that today, as we live in our world, it is full of chaos? What does it mean that Jesus has driven out the ruler of this world? I get stuck in hopeless thinking when I look and see chaos upon chaos, injustice continuing, senseless death continuing, war, and it goes on and on. What does it mean, Jesus? And God continues to say to me, remember, this is not the end of the story. Nothing will stop my purposes in this world. 
I am the resurrection and the life. Believe me. Hebrews 2 goes on to talk about this in, in the fact that Jesus has shared flesh and blood like us and therefore died that he might destroy death. And free all of those whose lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Do you catch that? What is he freeing us from? The fear of what? The fear of death. In the message it says, by embracing death, he destroyed the devil's hold on death and freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. I wonder, are we enslaved to a fear of death? What does that look like? How do we cower? What do we cower in the face of? I think that the fear of death has many faces. I have to look at my life and wonder how many of my decisions are controlled by fear. Fear of losing power, fear of becoming irrelevant, fear of what I will lose, fear of what I am dying to, fear. But then he gives us a word of hope. Because he has been tested and suffered, he can help us when we face those testings, those sufferings, even death itself. Because Jesus is walking with us. And so Jesus, in obedience, goes single-mindedly towards the cross, face like flint. And I also like what it says in Hebrews 5, 9, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having made, been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. I love that phrase, the source of eternal salvation. It's like bubbling up. For who? For all who obey for all who obey him, for all who put faith, belief into action. When Jesus died, he died to a number of things, not just death on a cross. <clears throat> In Philippians 2, it talks about he, how he died to his position as God. And although he was in the form of God, <clears throat> he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but he made himself he emptied himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus obeyed. Neither can we have full life without obedience. And as we invite Jesus into our lives and follow, we begin to truly live. We aren't just running from death, we are living. Jeremiah, Jeremiah talks about the new covenant written on our hearts. Not a covenant like the ancestors the people of Israel when they were being brought out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, it says in Jeremiah. Why did they broke it? Why did they break it? Because they were afraid. They were afraid of death. Fear of dying out in this wilderness. Fear of not enough water, not enough food. Fear of those giants. When they go into the land of Canaan, they come back with this report, there's those giants in there, and they make us feel like grasshoppers. We can't go in there. And even though they taste those amazing grapes, they say, we're not going in there. They'll eat us up. We'd be better in Egypt. We'd be better off as slaves. We knew what we were getting. 
and the promised land is right there. They tasted it. A life of faith and following Jesus is one of trust. When we are out in the unknown, in that place where we're out of control and we don't know what to do, we at times long for safety, even if it's, even if it's the slavery of Egypt, because somehow that's what we know. We don't fully realize the bondage we're in until we get out of it. Have you ever been at that place where you look back on your life and you say, I didn't realize it was that bad. I didn't know how fearful I was. I didn't know how stuck I was. But now I can see. For the people of Israel and for us today, this life of following Jesus puts us in the unknown. At times it puts us in scary places that we have never been before. I think of our, our position right now as a congregation as we face the question of where will we affiliate. It's a place of the unknown and we are counting the cost. Things will be different. We will lose some familiarity and comfortableness. We don't really know what it's going to be like. And sometimes we just long to go back and just Let's just keep things as they are. But within that, we trust that there will be new life, new connections, new opportunities. And so we look at the journey and we see how God has led us together. And we review the process and the moments that God has spoken. And we find the courage to move forward together. Because Jesus is among us, and there is no resurrection until there is first of all death. What exactly does it look like to die to self? For some, it means physical death. For most of Jesus' apostles, for the martyrs, for the people in martyr's mirror, for even M.J. Sharp, that's a high cost to follow. What does it mean for each of us? I don't know. Honestly, I've struggled with that question because I wanted to come with some neat answer. But I don't have one. I don't know fully what it means for me. I don't know what it means in your life. But what I do know is that it is obedience one step at a time to what it is that God has put in front of us even when we can't fully see where that takes us. That's what it means to die to self and to follow. And maybe one of the first questions for us is to ask ourselves, what do I fear? Where are those places that I find myself frozen? I, I can't act. I'm not sure what to do, but I, I want to do something. I'm, I'm drawn to this, but I, I, I'm terrified. What is it that makes your stomach, your stomach churn? The place in you that says, I would, but I'm afraid. that place of passion and concern and wanting to make a difference. This is where we are called to look deep inside and ask God, God, show me what I need to know. Open my eyes. Let me see beyond this chaos, this fear, to see your way, to see your power. The chains have been broken. Free me, God, to follow and live into that. And God will faithfully bring fruitfulness when we take the risk to plant the seed. 
Jesus says, I have broken the chains. When you die to what is binding you, you are freed to live now. Live, live, live with abandon. Eternal life awaits. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. It's a lot for us to think about. And so I would invite us into a time of silence to reflect on a few questions that will be on the screen. Some key questions that came out of this text. Do I believe that Jesus can give me new life in my life situation? What fears keep me from living in freedom? And how am I being called to put into action my belief in Jesus? I invite you into a time of reflection.